So <coughs> the first one, which is the global practice, I'm going to run through uh, the, the four practices and show you some examples of what I believe uh, represent uh, the, the products that come out of these practices. So in, today, in today's India, rocketing levels of consumption spurred by a rapidly increasing and economically mobile middle class are driving the construction of a new landscape of global derivatives. The pattern of architectural practice concerned with the construction of these global identities is largely a corporate one. That and its influence is today probably one of the most visible in the public realm. Assuming a sophisticated building industry, this pattern of practice communicates its design intentions through a very well detailed set of instructions and documents that are translated into the building. And that's why this can happen internationally. You email all your drawings. The, the detachment from locale is really acute. The practice is usually organized in the form of a large firm with in-house specializations and services. In the recent past, the acceleration of India's economic liberalization uh, has caused several Asian, American, and European corporate architectural firms that have begun to build in India, further perpetuating this pattern of construction, as well as the kind of images that go with it, you know, curtain wall glazing, metal clad facades, central air conditioning, uh, a, a real emphasis on providing adequate parking, which might be good, security systems, uh, and many, many other features, and obsession with the leads uh, sort of uh, uh, qualification, uh, etc. But I think what what they really do is they create an overarching sense of total containment, uh, and they make these implants very recognizable in the Indian landscape. And that's how you can kind of characterize them. So this pattern of global practice has been patronized by multinational corporations, developers, starting in the mid 90s by the government as well as uh, you know, uh, semi-government organizations, usually for their financial institutions, to again give capital comfort. Similarly, given the boom in software exports, the information technology industry has been largely emerging as a patron for this global architecture. Software campuses in the outlying areas of Hyderabad, New Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai are becoming sites for the manufacture of this imagery, which is rapidly being emulated by smaller operators across the country. The quantity of such architecture is increasing as globalization gains a foothold in India. And its impact on the profession, as well as people's perceptions of it, is perpetuated by the media. It becomes uh, the kind of emblematic image because it's photogenic, etc. Projected to make India appear more efficient and competent, this representation also makes Indian architecture look similar to its manifestations of, manif the manifestations of globalization elsewhere in the world. So it becomes this sort of universalizing thing. But really, it is often used just to make us feel and look competent, whether it's the airport. Sometimes you walk into a hospital where there's a crazy atrium, and everything behind the atrium falls apart. The atrium is just that moment to give you the confidence. That seems to be sort of what works. However, the limitation of architecture in these circumstances are only too evident. A predictability and detachment to the build from, from its ambient environment, a divorce from place and community, and an indifference to the imperatives of tectonic innovation and material resources. The resulting gated communities and privately initiated housing projects are emblematic of the emerging global suburbs characterizing the landscape of India's post-liberalized economy. And I think this is quite deadly and something that needs to be really challenged and not submitted to. And I think we need to do this as a community. And also the nature of the office that practices here is, is, is quite different. And I think really historically, or at least in the, as when the country gained independence, work in the Indian private sector has always been small scale, focusing on a sort of artesian practice. Uh, not, a, not boutique necessarily, people use that term, which I don't sort of don't like, but it was a small sort of scale practice. And this was a natural outcome of the larger scale of work, whether it was institutional or housing, be de being delivered usually directly by the government through its own design agency. And in the 70s and 80s, that began to change a little bit. In the socialist economy, any large private sector establishment was equated with capitalism and consequently was commercially and morally, morally on the fringe of societal acceptability. And so I remember even in the 80s and 90s, any firm that was very big, and I don't want to name them, they were always deemed as commercial. I suppose because they had to do a lot more work and generate a lot more income to keep themselves going. But this culture was taboo. And as a result, India was, in a sense, ill-prepared for large-scale global, global practices as a country, had no tradition of making form 
in that way, at that scale, with that kind of integration of technology, of inputs, and that kind of competency. And so no tr substantial tradition or capability existed in the profession until the 1990s to do that. And often when first capital arrived, it was foreign capital who preferred their own sort of architect. These are sort of examples of how I think f as capital is more impatient, it's in a hurry to replicate uh, a grab bag sort of images. But as it gets more patient, it also uh, can begin to afford some sort of innovation. And so the second mode is the regional modernism, which is a kind of counterpoint to this sort of mode of practice by the global flows. Uh, and this has evolved, I think, today beyond its modernist roots to respond to the local in stronger ways. And this, uh, this process does not reject modernism, but rather the new form of internationalism perpetuated by the corporate pattern of practice in the face of globalization. And it seeks to resist those flows on their own terms. In fact, the regionalists see the importance of modernism as a mechanism to view tradition anew. And this is the power of this sort of mode of practice, because they are abstracting tradition and not falling into the trap of literal representation of cliches. And they recognize that modernism demands a respect for the inherent qualities of the building, material, expressiveness of material, structure, functional justification, etc. And they see nationalism as being separate from the concerns of the region, which is really the context they work in. And their endeavor is to really create a distinct identity without restoring, restoring to cliches or to kind of literal references within the tradition. And of course, hospital, I mean, hotels, institutions, single family homes, et cetera, uh, uh, patronize this. Uh, and these practices continue, I believe, to be centers of local resistance, which produce alternate modernities within the overarching narrative of globalization. In other words, while the patronage of this practice has now shifted from the state to the private sector, their, their, their ideals totally remain. The third one is the practice of what I call the alternate practice, uh, which is one that I think really begins to look at sort of sustainability as its question. And here the architect becomes the custodian of the vernacular tradition of the region and extends the sort of regionalist approach. This model really emerged in India in the 70s as a counterpoint to modernism and, and perceived the elimination of tradition that the modernist project implied. It somehow it began as a reaction to that. And it first manifests itself in the form of the architect as craftsperson, working directly with the builder, more or less eliminating drawings as a medium by which it communicates design intentions, the barefoot architect model, so to speak. Uh, and these practitioners began to very energetically adopt local material, vernacular building practices, a flexibility of design and open-endedness in, in, in terms of the way the form would go, um, etc. cetera. Uh, usually NGOs, cultural institutions, and some intellectuals uh, were the chief patrons of this model. But this model also resulted in a great deal of clumsiness because uh, form, which becomes very central to what the architect gives shape to, was sort of let loose and made so flexible that you began to I think get a, a representation of that architecture which did not, in my view, really uh, represent the spirit uh, and the pretty profound kind of spirit that it really was founded on. And, and so this has now been re-energized with globalization uh, and it encompasses architect activists and practitioners who've consciously chosen to be more reflective and consider the consequence of the action as well as the ways they can effectively counter global flows that marginalize both tradition and people. These practitioners enter into a potentially more fulfilling relationship with the site, its history, the community of users whose needs they address, and the members of the workforce that they collaborate with. So it's a real on-the-ground engagement, uh, which is very localized, which is very, very fine-grained. And these practitioners are actually viewed with great suspicion by mainstream architects because they challenge the more customary methods and models of professional practice because they're on the margins of these sort of practice. Uh, it's the last one, which is called counter-modernism. And here, I think simultaneous to all of this, there seems to be emerging a phenomena that has perpetuated a model or pattern of practice that is, that is facilitating the resurfacing of ancient Indian 